It's a machine beloved by purists. It's a symbol for Germany. A car admired by drivers. Getting better every model we build. And a high performance vehicle hated by rivals. When you're number one, you got a target on your back. The Porsche 911, perhaps the most iconic sports car ever made. You're not working for Patriots to work here because the very special products we produce. After half a century of success, it's now imprisoned by its past. Whenever there's a new 911 generation, there's a debate if this car is still a 911. Now, the newest version steps away from tradition and undergoes radical change, adding turbochargers to the full lineup for the very first time. The 911 represents uh, the brand purity. If you screw up your iconic vehicle, your identifier, it challenges the whole image of your brand. The result is a sports car that looks like a 911. But does it act like one? goes from 0 to 100 kph in just 4.6 seconds. Hits a top speed of 307 kilometers per hour. And starts at just over 82,000 euros. This is the all-new Porsche 911 Carrera S. A machine that blends racetrack performance with sporty luxury and is born into one of the most illustrious car families in the world. The 911 is, is one of the longest running names in the sports car scene. The brand it would not exist if it weren't for this car. The machine garners worldwide attention, but it actually comes to life in a tiny suburb located just outside of Stuttgart, Germany. The Porsche factory is located in Zuffenhausen, which is a suburb of Stuttgart. Even though the town is small, the competition here is fierce. If you live in Stuttgart, you either work for Mercedes-Benz or Porsche. Both are great, but we in Zuffenhausen do it just a little bit better. Zuffenhausen is one of the most important automotive locations on the planet. This is both the ancestral and the current home of the 911. definitely something that warms my heart whenever I go there. This is really a place filled with history. The car they build is revered by fans and factory workers. Every car is manufactured here by the heart of the people. We are petrol heads and we have a saying here at Porsche that is once Porsche, ever Porsche. I'm very stolz on as a Stuttgarter, I'm very proud to build Porsches. It's very good. The pride for the car cuts right to the core of the nation. The Porsche 911 is definitely one of Germany's uh, car icons, and most people know this coming from Germany. The national honor is apparent on the factory floor, where newly painted bodies enter every three and a half minutes. We decided to put the doors off uh, at the rather beginning to ensure that you had no damage. Company veteran Wolfgang Rice is the man in charge of 911 production. It's a, a combination of, of handicraft uh, knowledge because um, the know-how comes from doing. Yeah? You must work with the cars, you must uh, build them up yeah? from body and white, from paint job onwards and to the final assembly line where we are right now. Then it's time to stamp the unique identification number.
There's only space to engrave the number in the allotted time. And if you don't make it, the whole line stops. You must finish, and only then can work continue. In that sense, there's a little time pressure, but it's fine. Next, they wire the machine. Now we're already at station two. This is where we install the wiring harness. It's uncoiled, pulled to both sides, and clipped in. The size of the harness is a reflection of a core belief. At Porsche, every button does just one job. Just as every worker aims to do one task perfectly. Yeah, there are a lot of wires in the car. We got um, yeah, a couple of kilometers of wiring in all, in all the car. We just want to put out 100% quality. On this hallowed floor, the goal is not being flawless. It's something far greater. It's not perfect, it's really perfect. The mission to move beyond perfection comes from a one-of-a-kind sports car culture. Porsche mass-produces machines with handcrafted precision. And every year, they build just under 30,000 911s. I'm proud to work for this company. There's a feeling of pride because it's still a traditional family company in my eyes. And there are not too many of those left in Germany. To me, it's the best company in the world. The quest for excellence starts early. I can still remember the first day my dad turned in uh, to the garage with uh, 911. That was 30 years ago almost. And that was the day when I got fixed. My dad is working by Bosch for 30 years. When I was a child and I see the, all the workers, I see the cars, and it was a dream for me to work here. And so my dad do it, I do it again. Workers aren't the only ones wowed. The line is almost as fast as the car itself. We have 118 stations, yeah. and tech time right now about 3.7 minutes. We are talking about a lot of complexity and uh, derivatives on this one assembly line. The amount of choice is overwhelming. They build 16 different variants of the 911, but it certainly didn't start out that way. The tale begins in 1875 with the birth of Ferdinand Porsche. In 1931, he started up his own construction office. Ferdinand's engineering company quickly develops into a powerhouse. Uh, he wanted to offer his knowledge to the whole automobile industry. The construction office became the nucleus of the European automobile scene. He was working on race cars, on compact cars, even on, on little tractors. So it was really a big spectrum of, of technologies. In ma many cases, he was the first in the, in the game. In 1898, he built the first electric car. In 1900, the first hybrid car. He designed the Volkswagen Beetle, which was a kind of an important car in history. The Volkswagen Beetle is one of the most significant cars of the 20th century. It widens the availability of motorized transportation for the masses and lays the foundation for the Porsche brand we know today. There was the concept of the rear engine. There was the idea of a sort of a streamlined body. The rear-engined approach begins with the Beetle, but it becomes famous thanks to the 911. Driving a 911 hard is unique because it's a rear-engine car, and that affects the balance of the car in interesting ways. Today, the 911 has won over 30,000 races and is known as one of the world's preeminent sports cars. Yet what makes it unique is also its greatest liability. For over 50 years, the 911 has been an icon the sports car world, turning both fast laps and heads. Sometimes we have the chance to drive. It's very special. You feel it's like 
sitting in a rocket. We were pushed in the seats. One of the most important things about the 911 is they haven't ever screwed up the sports car side of it. They never lost the edge. It is still an amazing car to drive fast. Today, the 911 flies on the track and on the factory floor. 103 machines roll off the line per shift, thanks to a highly bonded team of craftspeople. You have with the people here, more than with your family. This is my friends. And after, we can go in a bar and drink a beer. When a shift ends, some workers might enjoy a beverage together. But at the windshield preparation station, the goal is to actually keep liquid out. This station we put on the rubber ceiling for the windscreen. I've got to be very careful to put the ceiling in here that nothing breaks or gets loose. Everything is running really smooth like a, a gearbox, you know? The factory runs like a gearbox, but it's where the engine sits in a 911 that makes it special. That weight balance makes this car drive in a totally unique way. The rear engine layout is a hallmark of the machine and perhaps the worst way to build a sports car. A Porsche engineer, if you get him drunk enough, will tell you that putting the engine out behind the rear axle is a terrible place from an engineering perspective. You have the heaviest components in the car behind the rear axle. And if you think of how a pendulum works, if you think about what happens to the car when it starts to rotate, where that weight wants to take the rear end of the car. Building a car with the heaviest component in the back creates a unique driving experience, thanks to physics. The 911 showcases exactly how the concepts of understeer and oversteer work. Understeer is when you see what you're going to hit, and oversteer is when you don't. Understeer is when the front wheels lose grip, and you've got the steering wheel turned, and the car's not turning. It's going to go straight right into whatever is in front of you. Oversteer is when the back end of the car comes loose, and the car wants to spin out on you. Staying in control is partly about the feel and partly about the information you see. Much of that data is relayed on the sport-orientated dashboard. The dashboard assembly is running in the same tech time like the main assembly line. There's no buffer between. The build starts in another building on the Zuffenhausen campus, where artisan leather workers bring fresh cow hides to an advanced layout table. They scan the hide for defects and arrange digital patterns that maximize the leather. Then they cut the shapes out using an air blade. The raw panels are sent to a parts supermarket where another craftsperson creates an interior kit. Next, one of the 280 specialized craftspeople sews the interior leather panels together. Finally, the dashboard is glued using a massive press. With the 911, it kind of depends on how you define luxury. You're getting nice leather, certainly nice materials, but these aren't luxury cars. These aren't the cars that ride with total supple smoothness. You feel the road. It all comes down to where your expectations of the car sit. Next to the final assembly line, workers install the headlight switch, the steering column, infotainment system, iconic gauge cluster with the tachometer front and center, and finally, the idiosyncratic left-handed starter key. They still have the key on the left, and it still comes to life with a character that's surely it's synthetic, but still sounds different than any other sports car. Placing the key on the left side of the instrument panel is a holdover from Grand Prix racing in the 50s. Back then, drivers dashed to their cars at the start of a race and fired up the engine with their left hand in order to keep the right hand free for the shifter knob. Halfway down the first line, they swing the finished dashboard into the car and bolt it into place. Until now, all 911 variants have basically been the same. But that changes at the next station. My work is today the Targa. We put the glass roof on it because the robot cannot do it. When I adjust the tolerance from about one millimeter to um, 0.5 millimeter, so it has to be accurate. 
Then it's time for the factory's only robot to join the party. The robot is a special one, yeah. Uh, he's responsible to put in the screens in the right position and to fix it uh, for several seconds with the right pressure. And he's precise, really, when he put on the clue on the screen that's, like, perfect. When the robot finishes, partially built 911s are sent downstairs on a lift. Downstairs, they put together the motor, the transmission, and the tires, everything. We're just putting small stuff. Without us, the car will not drive. Today, 911s are known as legendary high-performance driving machines, thanks in large part to Ferdinand Porsche's son, Ferry. Ferry Porsche, he stepped into the company as an intern in 1931. He didn't went to university. He was learning by doing, and he had, to, he had the best teachers you could imagine because the construction office was a team of the best car guys you could find in Europe. Ferry takes control of the engineering business in 1948. It was definitely not easy for Ferry Porsche because his father was a genius and invented so many famous car technologies. The father-son relationship becomes even more complicated when Ferry sets out to transform the engineering outpost into a fully-fledged car company. It was a very big step because first time the, the company changed from being a construction office into a car maker. Ferry's dream is to build a proper sports car. The result is the 356, a lightweight four-cylinder machine and the very first vehicle adorned with the Porsche name. This was a very risky business. It was directly after World War II. Nobody really needs a sports car. Uh, people were building up Europe again. And uh, yeah, Ferry Porsche, he designed a car which he sold for 10,000 Deutschmarks. For this money, you could have almost three Volkswagen Beetles. This, this was crazy, but uh, he realized very quickly that other people shared his dream of a perfect sports car, and that's the secret of the success of the 356. The initial goal is to sell 500 machines. It's a woeful underestimation. During the machine's 18-year production run, the company sells nearly 80,000 units. The success keeps Porsche afloat, but by the late 50s, Ferry knows the brand needs a new machine if it wants to continue. In the 1950s, the uh, society and the customer base of, of Porsche changed. Luckily, the third generation named F.A. Porsche got into the company. And in 1959, he designed the prototype. Initially, the machine is called the 901. And when it debuts at the 1963 Frankfurt Auto Show, it catches everyone's eye including French automaker Peugeot. Peugeot claimed to have the legal rights for all car names with three figures and a zero in the middle. They still use the system today. Ferry Porsche took a very pragmatic solution. The letters, they were already produced, so they had the nine, they had the zero and the one. And so at the end, they just exchanged the zero by another one and the car became the 911. The renamed 911 develops an almost fanatical following amongst serious driving enthusiasts. First time I worked here, I was like, wow, it's extreme. Because Porsche is a supercar. Makes me proud to be one of this family who built these supercars. Big emotion, and um, I'm happy that I built a car. It's this car all over the world. Part of the machine's appeal comes from its iconic shape. If you ask a little boy to draw a sports car, in most cases, the result will look like a Porsche 911. Porsche has managed was to keep the basic ingredients, but turn it into a car that looks modern, but it still maintains its character. The design of the 911 is something that's been carefully massaged throughout the decades. It's they've honed continually over the years. These days, they refine and advance the shape in the body shop, where they build a mixture of 200, 911, and Boxster exteriors inside a highly compact facility.
It's hard to see, but behind me, the robots are assembling the front end, the back end, and the middle. The first step is to weld the underbody together. They add the front and rear crash structures. Then the rough looking chassis is sent upstairs to be finished. The stations move in a three and a half minute tag time. Two hundred and forty people work here and another two hundred robots help out. Together, they use a mixture of materials to create the body. The materials used are high allowed steels, magnesium, and a lot of aluminium. They put on the doors. Part of the process is manual, the rest is robotic. We need the accuracy of the people and the speed of the robots. Next, they bolt on the front fenders. After that, the front lid is mounted. This is very close to the end of the line. The body has to be perfect. The iconic looks and the pursuit of perfection have been the brand's calling card for well over 50 years. When you're building a 911, you have immense pressure. There's certain performance targets you have to hit, but you also have decades of history that you have to serve correctly. Now, the 911's greatest advancement could be just around the next bend. But whether Porsche fans agree with it is anyone's guess. For over half a century, the 911 has defined the sports car world thanks to its idiosyncratic traits, unique powertrain layout, and high-performance history. They found something that worked for them, and it was a unique, different car that people really loved. The affection rockets the tiny manufacturer to fame. It has defined the brand. The 911 is Porsche. Porsche is the 911. However, the more success, the more typecast the car becomes. You can make the argument that the 911 is trapped by its history. By the late 70s, the brand is determined to move on. They've tried over the years to replace it with other cars that are better in, in some way to wean people off of the 911. Since engineers can't modernize the car, they decide to supplant it with a new machine called the 928. The 928 was supposed to replace the 911. It was a V8 front engine sports car luxury super cruiser, you tear down the Autobahn a million miles an hour, and nobody bought it. In the early 80s, the brand tries again, this time introducing the 944, a lower-priced four-cylinder front-engine car. There was a lot of years, especially like in the 80s, when they really wanted to do something else. They really wanted to build a different car. The desire to move on culminates in a do-or-die decision. The 911 almost ended until there's a very famous boardroom meeting where uh, one of the executives writes 911 on the board and says, this is what our brand is, and this is what will continue to be uh, a Porsche as, you know, for the end of time. The stay of execution keeps the 911 alive, but it doesn't stop technology from advancing. As decades go on, we find ways to improve cars, sometimes in a way that purists don't like. To remain at the forefront, the 911 has to evolve, even if its customers don't like it. There's an old quote that you know, I'll tell you in business school that the customer doesn't know what they want until you tell them. Engineers decide the only option is to move on from the car's traditional air-cooled engine and to switch to a water-cooled power plant. The Porsche faithful freak out. The biggest controversy in the history of Porsche was going from air-cooled engines to water-cooled engines. We were all doubting whether this was the right way to go. And out of the sudden, we found ourselves in a crisis. You take away from people what they have been loving and replace it with something that is a different animal. This is a point when there wasn't another car on the planet that was still running an air-cooled engine. When the first water-cooled engine was introduced in 1997, they said that's the end of the brand. The water-cooled car shocks fans, 
yet it also becomes the best-selling 911 ever up to that point. If you want to get into trouble, stand still. If you want to avoid that, you have to move ahead. Today, the brand faces a similar challenge thanks to a similar change. Starting in 2016, all 911s, regardless of trim, are turbocharged. Now you're saying we're going to add this turbo to it, and the turbocharger, it changes the characteristics of an engine. The significant of the change is when they went from air-cooled to water-cooled, because it significantly changes the character of the engine, which is so vital to the people who love Porsche 911s. The man who carries the burden is chief engineer August Achleitner. When we develop a new 911, we have a look into the past, but also we have a look in the future. The biggest detail is a completely new powertrain. The completely new powertrain is uh, like a transplantation of the heart of the uh, car. This step uh, from the naturally aspirated engine to the turbocharged engine is a bigger step, in my opinion, than years ago, the step from the air-cooled engine to the water-cooled engine. The turbochargers deliver more power and better fuel economy, yet the danger is they can also add turbo lag. This was a challenge to, to, to have a turbocharged engine, but not to feel you have a turbocharged engine. So it was a challenge we had to take. The new turbocharged flat-six engines are born one bolt at a time inside another building on the Zuffenhausen campus. This assembly line builds all B-motors for the sports cars. The process begins in an area they call the supermarket. Here we are at the beginning. We take the paper and start uh, to pick the, uh, the parts for this engine. Each craftsperson collects over 300 parts before taking them to the line, where every shift, they build 250 engines. Here we are at the beginning of the production of the assembly. Here you see the crankcase, the camshaft. We see the connecting rods uh, with these pistons, the, the basic of the engine. We produce mainly with, um, with automatic stations because we need a precise process. Workers scan every single part that goes into the engine. We ensure that we have the right parts with uh, our barcode uh, reader. Part by part, the scanning system builds up a database for each engine. It's a mechanical medical record. Should anything fail, the team can go back and find out why. During the production process, uh, we have round about a thousand data about one engine. If something goes wrong, I can go into the data and can look, is there something wrong? Keeping track of all the parts is a crucial tool when you build a variety of power plants. We have designed the different variants, the GT3, the turbocharged engine, the former uh, naturally aspired engines. So we have one module design. Over 20 different versions of the flat six engine are built here, yet the basic layout is identical. Porsche calls it a boxer. At a boxer motor, the pistons lie. Uh, it's 180 degrees between the angle of, uh, of the pistons and uh, they work like, uh, like a boxer. The unique size and shape of the boxer motor is a result of where it sits in the vehicle. What you see here is how flat the engine is. If you remember the shape of the 911, you can imagine how that engine goes into the back. When workers finish putting together the guts of the motor, they send it to another line. At the main line, uh, we've got about uh, 75 uh, stations. Each station has about uh, 2.73 uh, uh, minutes. 130 craftspeople work on this part of the line alongside a handful of high-tech robots. 
with quite automatic stations with robots for things we have to do um, very often. But uh, a lot of things uh, we have to do in, the, in our assembly line are very complicated and uh, complex and there we let our workers do it. So here we are at uh, the point uh, where the cylinder head uh, meets the, the main engine. At the end of the main line, the engines make a U-turn and flip around. What you see is, it's a mainly man-driven assembling part. New engines are now ready for the most important station. This is where the controversial turbochargers are installed. This is a turbocharger. This is, this is special. This is the new design, the new part of our engine. Porsche's radical decision to put turbochargers on every engine in the 911 lineup breaks with tradition. But it's not the first time they've turbocharged the car. That honor goes to a machine codenamed the 930. In 1973, Porsche presented the very first 911 turbo. And this was a big, big surprise for the automobile world because it was the first time that there was a turbocharged engine uh, installed in a production car, which was actually really working. The high-powered, hot-rodded engine's introduction coincides with a worldwide oil crisis. In Germany, it was not allowed to drive on Sundays. They introduced speed limits on the autobahns. Everybody actually went down with engine outputs and power figures. And Porsche had the guts to say, we've been uh, very successful in racing. Like, we know what we do here. So why not trying to do the same thing for a road car? The turbos help the 930 create 260 horsepower and reach a top speed of 246 kilometers per hour. The high speed necessitates a bold change to the exterior. Engineers are forced to add a large rear wing, nicknamed the whale tail, to keep the car glued to the ground. They knew they need downforce at the rear, which the original shape of the 911 never had. The whale tail isn't the only catchy name for the car. The 930 had a nickname and not a good one. They, it was known as the Widowmaker. Those things were like light switches. Nothing's happening, nothing's happening, and all of a sudden, they come on a whole lot of people who didn't know what they were getting into. They go spinning off into a tree. Today's turbochargers don't spin you off the road, but they do spin up to 190,000 revolutions a minute. Yet it only takes a craftsperson seconds to install them. We need the knowledge of our people. And that is the next thing that is different, I think, here at Porsche. Every three hours, a finished engine comes off the line, but it still has one more stop. This is the final test. It is a dry test. We don't fire the engine, but it is more precise than running the engine. We check 500 parameters here, and if one parameter is not in the range, the engine doesn't go on uh, with the assembling process. When an engine passes its test, it's time to send it across the street to the final assembly hall where each new power plant will meet its matching body right in sequence and just in time, thanks to an American idea and a Japanese trick. Since 1964, Porsche has built over 800,000 911s in the exact same location. Zuffenhausen. It's the most modern facility you could imagine. And every chance they have to make it more efficient, they go for it. And by doing so, they save this car. Today, they manufacture nearly 16 different versions of the car. When you're looking to buy a 911, you have dozens of trims to consider. Then choose your level of power. Do you want rear drive, all-wheel drive? Do you want a big sunroof, no sunroof? Do you want it to be track special? Do you want it to be street focused? What do you want the car to do? You think about the, the 911, from your base car up to your top shelf 911, that's a $80,000, $90,000 price swing from a standard six-owner turbocharged basic right up to a 911 turbo. 
with 100 plus more horsepower, 150 more horsepower. There's a, a wide variety. The incredible variety is due to some heady engineering solutions and the worst financial crisis the company ever faced. In the late 80s, Porsche was in big financial troubles. All the cars were made by hand and was not very profitable. Just as the car has to advance to stay relevant, the downturn forces the factory to modernize. We had a tremendous loss at that time, and therefore we changed everything in our manufacturing world. The company's salvation literally lies on the other side of the world. In the early 90s, fired by the automobile industry in Japan, we introduced processes of lean production. Lean manufacturing is a just-in-time inventory system that reduces the number of parts waiting to be installed. Throughout the history of automobile manufacturing, you have a couple key innovations. First was definitely uh, Ford creating you know, the assembly line. Then the Japanese brand take that concept and find it. Then Porsche makes it work in a way that allows them to service so many different variations of a car. When the system is implemented, the factory houses more than a month's worth of parts. Today, they hold just one and a half days worth of stock. There's so many different variations and so many different customizations on one standard type of body. And that's really difficult for something that's produced in numbers as large as this. The drastic change reinvigorates the brand and jumpstarts a renaissance that continues to this day. Today, Porsche is not only well known for its cars, it's also well known for its, its processes, for its production methods. More than 560 different suppliers deliver components to the Zuffenhausen factory, often just hours before they're needed on the line. Today, though, the production is extremely process oriented All the parts come just in time. It's extremely well managed. Every 225 seconds, a partially built machine enters the lower floor of the final assembly hall. A giant sea hook raises and lowers the car so that workers can access every nook and cranny underneath. They install sound deadening material, oil, fuel and water lines. Fuel cells are delivered to the line and installed. The intercoolers are bolted in place. And headlights are slid into the front fenders. Not so easy, yes? The headlight has many things you can uh, chip the pain, yes? In another part of the factory, workers begin building up the drivetrain. Brembo disc brakes arrive from a sub-supplier. Shock absorbers are fitted and bolts are tightened. You have a lot of really cool tech features on the new 911s. Both the Carrera and the Carrera S now come with PASM, which is their active damper system. Uh, which allows you to adjust uh, between a softer setting for road use and a sport setting. On another line, power plants arrive from the engine hall. We fix the engine and the gearbox together, mount the exhaust system. The manual comes standard, but you also have a, a dual-clutch transmission that allows you to get extremely fast upshifts. And it's certainly the fastest accelerating variant of any 911. Finally, all the drivetrain sub-assemblies meet on a moving jig. And they add the drive shaft. 
We take the sassy and the brakes and the engine, all the parts are come here in this uh, part together. It's simple, but uh, it's a lot of parts and we put it all together, yeah. I'm very proud to work in uh, this part of uh, Porsche, yeah. A new 911 is ready for its famed flat six engine. The engine and goes up to the rest of the car. It's the most challenging type. You have to look that all fits in. So this special thing you have. The marriage is one of the heart of each uh, plant. Yeah. There we have uh, three big uh, logistic issues. One is the car, of course, which is pre-assembled at that time. The other one is the powertrain, the engine and transmission, which is linked. And the third logistic part is uh, the axles, the front and the rear axle. The nuptials happen fast thanks to some high-tech help. It's more than 50 uh, volts. And some bolts are done uh, automatically. Yeah. And very important is to ensure that each screw has the right torque yeah, and there the response for the people working in that uh, area gets from the screen. It's uh, green or red. When the screen turns green, the car is good to go. Even though the tools are modern, it's the fellowship that gets the job done. Without teamwork, you can do uh, nothing here on this part here. After the engine is fitted, they install hoses that help the power plant breathe. After the marriage, yeah, we uh, put the bumpers in the rear and in the front on the car. We put uh, the air filter on the engine. Also put the spoiler on the, on the car. Then it's time for the iconic Porsche nameplate. And some fluids. We do plugs from the, uh, the engine and we fill the fuels. As the car moves down the line, parts continue to arrive just in time and just in sequence. This is the, we call it Berta. It brings the new parts to the worker on the right place. This uh, part comes on this Bertha for, uh, for this car. Bertha is a high-tech way to ensure parts arrive on schedule, but it's the old timers who safeguard the Porsche way. The older men teach me how I must work, and I teach the younger how they must work. I'm very proud. I'm, it's, a, it's a good feeling, very good feeling. The machine is almost ready to rumble, but first it needs a set of wheels. It's a very special uh, manufacturing uh, station because we uh, put on the tire. And that process is on the left side of the car and on the right car. And we had a lot of different wheels. And then afterwards, it's nearly ready to run. 
At this point, the majority of the mechanical parts have been installed. So the team turns its attention to the luxury interior. They install the center console. A craftsperson fits stereo speakers into the cabin panels. And they add the communicative steering wheel. The steering wheel is more than 170 variants, yeah? Um, and therefore, if you had the combination of all possibilities, yeah? It's like in mathematic uh, facultät, yeah? Uh, it's not possible to count. The steering is wonderfully responsive. It turns into a corner perfectly. The car's very well balanced. They've been working for years to, to sort out the, the chassis of this car to mitigate the fact that the engine's in the back and make it handle as neutrally as possible. You don't have to be an expert anymore to drive a 911. Further down the line, bigger pieces are bolted on. On this area, we built the, the seats, the doors, and we, we make instruction of the doors and on the windows, the back seats, and this. It's a magic, magic job here. The car is almost done, but it still needs a jolt of juice and a little bit of fuel before it can hit the road. Finally, after 30 hours, a brand new 911 is ready to hit the track. The 911's always been a, a special car because it's the one that doesn't make any sense, right? They put the engine in the back and it's this little, you know, funny bug-shaped car. But from the start, it wasn't just a, a historical oddity. It was always really fun to drive. The driving pleasure starts in 1963. And it continues today, thanks to a dedicated staff of engineers who repeatedly have fought off physics to help the car advance. History and, and technology, they're sometimes at odds, and that's how the 911 can feel limited by its history. It's probably the hardest job in the automotive world is designing a new 911, because it has to look like a 911, but it also has to look new. And no matter what you do, everyone's going to be mad at you. On the other hand, it's kind of a good problem to have, right? Your, your customers love your product so much that they want the, the newest and greatest, you know, version of it. Purists might fight change, but for the team at Porsche, it's a time-honored way to do business. I think it's a very pragmatic form of function. A little bit the character of the Swabians, you know, the part of Germany this car is being built at. They are very pragmatic and rational people. They say the goal is it's got to go fast. The goal is it's got to go fast around a racing uh, track. The goal is it has to be very uh, economical on fuel. So they sit down together and they come up with a car that like a 911. The newest version offers turbocharged engines in every model. It gets confusing when it comes to turbocharged 911s because you've always had a Porsche 930, a Porsche Turbo. Now all the models are turbocharged, how does that work? On the outside, they're going to say this is for performance. Turbochargers make more power, you can go faster. But what's really driving this is that turbocharged cars perform better on government fuel efficiency tests. Porsche sees a lot of strength in the 911 Turbo. In fact, the, the Turbo model itself outsells every single other 911. It's an extremely popular car, so they'd be insane to get rid of that brand. Not that long ago, people both inside and outside the company clamored for the 911 to fade away. When you look at why the 911 is what it is, you trace it back to the roots. There's some handling quirks. Throughout the years, though, Porsche has found a way to make those handling quirks work, and the modern version of the car is an extremely good handling machine. 
thanks to a strong sense of national pride, some daring engineering solutions, and an unquestionable amount of passion, the 911 has continued to be a true driver's machine. When you hop in a 911, you have a very good view in front of you because there's no engine. You have a really nice, agreeable shift in your hand. In front of you, you have a nice, giant, center-mounted tack, which is so nice in a sports car. In the case of the manual cars, you have these pedals that are positioned like near perfectly for heel-toe downshifting and upshifts and all that. The incredible thing about the 911 is that every time we think that it's gone too far, that it's gotten too soft, that it's become overrated, that it's a victim of its own success, they come out with a version of it that's, that's still an amazing sports car. I know there's a lot of people who are really, you know, hardcore 911 enthusiasts that will say that 60s, 70s, 80s are the best 911s. They were the, the purest expression of the 911. But if you're not a super Porsche enthusiast, even if you're just a general car enthusiast, or even if you're not a car enthusiast at all, this new one is unquestionably the pinnacle. I think objectively, the, the new 911 is the best 911 they've ever built. It is the most comfortable 911 there's ever been to drive. It is the richest and most refined. It's a machine trapped by its own history and yet continually capable of evolving it. The Porsche 911, a German symbol, a high performance rocket, and perhaps the most iconic sports car ever made. Mr. Porsche came up with a lot of great quotes during his lifetime. And maybe the most important one was, I looked around and I couldn't find the car that I wanted, so I decided to build it myself.